Hello, welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. I preach for the Church of Christ in Wadsworth, Ohio, on West Good Avenue. Glad you're able to watch the show with us. We're doing a study of the book of Psalms. In this particular lesson, we're going to look at Psalm number 11. And I just put sort of a theme there, God tests the righteous. You know, there's a lot of subject matter in the Psalms. It's uh, the largest portion of the Bible is the Psalms. It's towards the center of the book. Uh, matter of fact, I can still remember as a kid being told if you open your Bible to the middle of the book, most likely you're going to hit the Psalms because they're towards the middle and there's so many of them. And it's a very important book and, and it has so many different subjects and emotions and it, it's just a tremendous study to do. When we look at Psalms, in, they have different authors and there's actually five different books and I'll show you a chart here to give you an idea where we're at. Uh, you have five different books. It's broken apart, even though we refer to it as one book, uh, and different chapters within those books. And the yellow highlighting there of number 37, uh, there's 37 of the Psalms in book one, which is Psalms 1 through 41. 37 of those were written by David, by the inscription. And then notice four anonymous, and sometimes anonymous gives people uh, reason to be concerned, but Jesus endorsed the Psalms, in Luke 24, 44. So you want to keep that passage handy in your mind. But you know, when we talk about the Psalms, it's important to remember, we've covered this before, uh, about these inscriptions. Uh, there's inscriptions on the Psalms, and, and I have an introduction to the Old Testament uh, by Edward J. Young, and he, and he talks about it here. I'm not going to read it again, but if you look at Psalm 11, <clears throat> you'll see the words, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Now that's not technically a part of the psalm text. What it is is an inscription that was added uh, probably during the days, as this source uh, points out, uh, during later days, days after David had been long gone. But it's still within the period of when the Bible was being written, during the period of, like I call it, the days of inspiration. So whether somebody wants to debate whether or not these are inspired or not, they can do that. I don't know how they're going to resolve it, but they're more welcome to do that. But we know that they're very ancient. They're very old. They go back to Ezra. They go back to the time when people were more familiar with the immediate events of their time. And so there's really no reason to doubt uh, what this one says uh, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Now, as we read this Psalm and study it together, and we you look at it, we, we don't really know the circumstances under which these events happen in David's life. And he may not, they may not have been events in his life when he wrote this. Uh, people have inspiration or feelings to write things, uh, different things, you know, for, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, an experience that's driven them to it. And, but when you read it, you can see that the idea of the psalmist, the person who's writing it, is under a lot of duress. And there's, there's times of choosing, and, and this is important, and we need to remember uh, that God tests the righteous. And that's what Psalm 11 here is. And notice I have this picture here, this bird. This bird is flying uh, to the mountain because there's a line in this psalm that's very familiar. Matter of fact, there's a traditional hymn uh, that has that line in it that uh, you'll recognize, I'm sure. But it may be a surprise to some people, that idea that God tests the righteous. Sometimes people have misconceptions about God, and one of them I wonder about if people believe that God just protects Christians and doesn't let anything bad happen to them. And that, was sort of, that was the contest between uh, God, Satan, and Job. Remember, Satan says, the accuser says, you know, the only reason Job is good to you and, and praises you is because you protect him. You have his hedge around him. And God removes the protection. He gives Satan the authority <clears throat> to abuse Job, to put him to the test. And while Satan is the one that's doing the evil to Job, God has allowed that to happen. And that troubles people at times. They think that God... If you're a Christian, then you, know, you should have divine protection and nothing ever bad should happen to you. Or maybe you're a nation, and like our nation, they think, you know, we're a Christian nation, people would say, 
And they would say, well, you know, God is going to remove his divine protection from us when we turn away from him. Well, that's definitely true. Uh, that's taught. Uh, those kinds of principles, that kind of line of thinking is taught in the Bible. <clears throat> but God still, there comes a point when God's going to allow evil or wickedness or temptation or trials. He's going to allow that to happen to us. And we need to be prepared. You know, we, we, often, you know, we, we often want to say, you know, God, I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. You know, no matter what bad happens to me, I'm going to be faithful to you. No matter what difficulty it is, I, I will never forsake you, right? We say that kind of stuff. I mean, we say that kind of thing at marriage, right? If you're sick, if you're, you know, sickness and health and all that, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Well, how do we do that? How, how do we demonstrate that? How do we prove it? Well, if you're a husband or wife, you, you prove it every day of your marriage because you stay there no matter what. But there is going to be testing. There's going to be trials. There's going to be difficulties. There'll be joys and triumphs, all these things. And the question is, do we go through these things as husband and wife with God or without God? Will the same be true for a nation? And the same is true for us individually. We are going to have difficulties. They may be difficulties that come from Satan. They may be trials that you know, God has permitted us to go through. We may not even know. You know, Job wasn't really told. He was just going through all these difficulties. <clears throat> Matter of fact, some of the things he was having trouble with was trying to figure out what was going on here. And he's not really told. And, and, and we're not told all the times. But we need to remember, there's a good passage in John 15, 1 through 2. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Pruning. Now, plants, you know, they don't experience pain like we experience pain. But it shouldn't be too hard for us to see that pruning is not exactly a joyful process for the plant. And if you extrapolate that or transfer that over from the plant to us and you say, well, what's pruning? Then you start to realize, well, wait a minute. That's difficulty. That's adversity. That's going through life and remaining faithful to God no matter what, if I'm going to be productive. And that's what God wants us to be. And that's what the subject of the psalm is. And we have to choose. We, ha we have to make our choice and we have to you know, keep to it and be with it. Now in Psalm 11, I'll give you the outline of what we're going to talk about in Psalm 11, 1 through 3. The first part is a short-sighted counsel. And then the last part of the psalm, God tests and he proves. But before we get into that, let's just read it together. And I'll read Psalm 11. I'm reading from the New King James Version. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the ones who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. So when we look at this, the first part is a short-sighted counsel. And that's the first three verses here. And I'll put them on the screen for you to take a look. We just read them. And it's short-sighted. And you can see that, you know, if you put your trust in the Lord, then why would you want to go anywhere else if you do that? Uh, the term refuge you know, there in that passage, the idea of a trusted place or shelter or safety. The Lord is our refuge. He is the place that we put our trust. The idea of flee as a bird to your mountain is sort of, is pointing the idea of, you know, whenever there's a stuttering or a startling uh, around, a bird will take off, right? It'll flee. And it's fleeing uh, to a position of safety. 
Well, what God is saying is if you put your trust in him, why would you say flee? Why would you run? Why would you do that? Why would you act like a bird? People need to you need to understand that you really have one of two choices. You can flee without God, or you can stand with God. The question is, is God with you? That's the test, right? That's what we're that's what's at stake. And there's not an exact consensus on when uh, this short-sighted counsel ends in these first uh, three verses here. Uh, some people think that uh, it comes uh, shorter than the other. But when you look at the idea of, you know, a bird that flees and the wicked are right there ready to shoot it down. Well, obviously, that's not the right, th that's not the right thing to do. I'm sure a lot of mourning doves and uh, other fowl have been killed because they've done that kind of thing. Didn't know. There's a hunter there ready to shoot him. Well, it's the same kind of thing. If you put your trust in the Lord, you stand with the Lord. You do what the Lord tells you to do. You don't act like a bird that gets startled and flutters right into the danger and gets shot down. Because the wicked are there. They're ready to do that. And how many times do people do that? How are they, you know, they just wait. And it's the idea of uh, they do it secretly under the cover of darkness. They, they don't just come out and tell you necessarily. They're like assassins. You know, their idea, they're trying to catch you. And, you know, you know how hunters, you know, they hunt. They're, you know, they, nothing wrong with being a hunter. I'm not, this isn't an anti-hunting program. But you know there's stealth involved. And there's training involved. And you know that they're trying to conceal themselves because they want that bird to be, or that duck, in, without any fear until they want that animal to react. And then they're ready with the reaction to that. See, there's training there. Well, the wicked, you know, they're looking. They're looking. They're poised to do that. Um, the idea of uh, foundations are destroyed, relating to that idea about the foundations are destroyed. What will the righteous do? And that moves us into the next section as we look at it. What happens if the foundation is destroyed? Well, it doesn't really matter if you're with the Lord. I mean, no matter if everything falls apart, if our ground becomes unsettled, maybe we'll lose our footing. Well, why? Well, because we put our trust in the Lord. He is impacted by the foundations. His foundation is in heaven. And so he's not you know, bothered by that. Now, the Lord is in his holy temple is an interesting phrase. It actually shows up in Habakkuk 2.20, also part of it in Micah 1.2. And it's interesting to, to think about, you know, what does that mean? The Lord is in his holy temple. Well, that's the place of safety. That's where we, that's where we want our hearts to be. And even when, you know, and use the analogy, a mountain collapses into the sea. You may say, okay, uh, fine, if any mountain, happen, if I happen to be out in the mountains and I happen to be surrounded by water and it happens to fall into the ground, you know, then I know that the Lord will take care of me. But what if it's something else? I mean, the idea of a mountain falling into the sea, that's a figure of speech. I hope we recognize that. And it may be other things. It may not be a physical mountain. It might be our health. What happens if I have perfectly good health and then at the age of 70 I have a brain tumor and then all of a sudden my whole life has been turned upside down and there's nothing that could be done. I could have surgery and I could extend it a little while. You see, that's what my father went through. But he put his trust in the Lord. It was difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. But that's what we need to understand. What if it's your marriage? I know that, you know, I have to preach on marriage and I have to preach on divorce and the idea of remarriage. And, and it's a difficult subject to preach on because you're preaching to people most likely who have been impacted by it. Maybe not they themselves, but maybe someone they love, maybe their children or maybe their parents or maybe their siblings. Divorce is so rampant. Maybe it's a marriage that falls apart. 
And I always feel really bad for the ones who kept their vows, but their spouse decided to flee. They decided to flee. And they have to cope with that. It's a very difficult subject. But, you know, even then, we have to remember we have to put our trust in the Lord. We have to put our heart and our souls with His foundation. It says the Lord hates violence. Hates violence. Cruelty, injustice, things like that. You know, it's sad when people accuse God of those kinds of things. And, but He hates that kind of stuff. That's what it says. It says that He sees with His eyes and He tests all men with His eyelids. Now, he, some, some religions out there, they, they depict God as, you know, he has, he has eyes and eyelid, and you can see him, and, and uh, maybe, you know, he has a bones of, you know, he has bones, flesh, and flesh and bones is that of a man. You, you know, some religions hold that view. But they made the mistake of recognizing a figure of speech called anthropomorphism. Anthropos, man. Morphism, form. Man form. It's a figure of speech. It's in literature. I had somebody one time, they were upset with me. They said, well, that's just a term you made up. I'm like, well, no, I didn't make it up. Well, that's just a term maybe somebody else might say. That's just a term that you people in the church uh, coined that term. No, that's not that either. It's actually a term in literature. It's a figure of speech. It is not unique to the Bible. The idea is you use things, use man as a form, in this instance, to depict what God does. Like when the passages say, with my, when God says, with my right hand, I reached down to Egypt and I took my people out of there. Well, if he was, oh, he has a right hand. No, it's a figure of speech. He did it. He just doesn't have a physical body like that. And that's called an anthropomorphism. And some people need to pay attention to that. God is attentive to those who are loyal to him. It doesn't mean he's going to protect them from everything. But people could put their trust in him. There's an idea, you know, God's actions against the wicked. And he gives you several different things there. Uh, he'll rain coals. Coals. Some people uh, translate it as snares. It's not pleasant. And he will rain fire and brimstone. That sort of reminds me of what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. That kind of a thing. Also, he will bring burning wind. Now, we don't have a lot of trouble necessarily with burning wind in our country. We do have tornadoes and we do have hurricanes and things like that. But in this part of the country uh, where the psalmist lived, uh, a burning wind was something that could kill crops and could do a lot of damage. Also, he will make them drink their cup of wrath. Their cup of wrath. Notice, you know, it's, they've stored it up. And he is going to permit them to abide it, to take it, because they've done it. They formed that. The Lord is righteous. He loves those who are righteous, too. Not only does he love those who are righteous, he preserves them. And see, that's what we're trying to get you to understand, trying to get you to see. Now, let me just read that last verse again. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you don't ever have to have any doubt that God loves me. Actually, everybody should know that, whether they're a Christian or not, that God loves them. John 3.16 tells us that. But God loves and protects and saves those who are loyal to Him, who obey Him. The wicked don't do that. And they will reap the consequences of that. But the righteous, God is mindful of them. He sees them. He knows them. And, and again, just to emphasize, that does not mean that we are immune from sickness, death, calamity, abuse, persecutions. But all those things, I just, they're temporal. They're temporary. God w deals in the eternal. And that's where we're heading to. When we go into the eternal, 
we want to have our trust in God. And if we have our trust in God, really trust Him, we don't have to flee as a bird to the mountain. We don't have to fly into danger. We can stand with confidence. And no matter what happens in this life, no matter how bad it may get, and it may not, we may have relatively, we may have, you know, pretty easy lives. But you know what uh, some of my friends are finding? <laughs> I've heard this expression from them more than once. Getting old is not for wimps. It's not for wimps. Some, have, <laughs> some of them have major battles just getting out of bed, just getting to eat. Some have conditions that they're in constant pain all the time. I can remember a lady told me she had vertigo for two and a half hours. You know what I thought? I mean, definitely sympathetic towards her, but you know what I thought? I, I, in my mind, I thought, I have no idea what that is. I know I didn't want it, and I know I didn't want her to have it. Until one day, I was down in my basement one time, and all of a sudden, my, it felt like my body was going like this. And just spinning back and forth like that. And I was reading about it, and it turns out that's vertigo. And I thought, oh, you know, for maybe, you know, the first 30 seconds, it might have been, you know, maybe if I was a teenager, I think it was cool. But uh, two and a half hours of that? No. No, no. No. You see... We may face the biggest challenges by just living our lives to their completion. When our bodies start wearing out, that's when our faith in God must carry us through those trials. And they will come. They may not come from an enemy who either shoot a bow at us, but life has a way of rushing in and complicating things. We have to have our trust in God. So when we talk about God tests the righteous, as we conclude some of this, let me give you some thoughts. One is, God is our refuge. He's our refuge. While God is not a place on our map, heaven's not a place on our map, our refuge belongs with Him. This world is not our home. Our home is with God. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says this, Therefore comfort one another with these words. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, I wonder what the voice of a, an archangel sounds like. And I'm like, I don't know. But believe me, when you hear it, you'll know it. You'll know it. And before you hear that voice, you will want to have done everything you can to have put your trust in God. Also, the wicked are subversive, and, and they don't care about a fair fight. They don't care about what's fair. And you need to remember that. You know, God's people, you know, open and honest and try to be above... But you know what? When you're dealing with the wicked, now some people you know, may be decent people, but that would be an assumption. You need to be careful about that. Also, Christ is our foundation, and that can never be destroyed. It says that in 1 Corinthians 3.11, No other foundation can anyone lay that, that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's where the foundation is. That's the foundation that won't be destroyed. All other foundations here will be. But that one will not. Also, we need to recognize that we're in a spiritual war. We're in a spiritual war. I'm not talking about you know, terrorism and things like that. I'm talking about good versus evil. Also, Jesus remains on the throne. You know, Sometimes we get caught up in the politics of the day, and we forget that. And we must not forget that. Jesus is on his throne. Also, the Lord knows the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. We may have trouble with that, but the Lord doesn't have any trouble with that. And we need to know also that God will severely punish the wicked. 
Now, I, I say that, one, you know, you might be thinking, oh, that's a revenge kind of thing he's talking about. I want you to repent. I want you to obey the gospel. And one of the things I want you to think about is God severely punishes the wicked. You don't want to be a part of that crowd. You need to change. Psalm 11, God tests the righteous. He makes sure that those who say that they are his really are. And I hope that you will try to do so as well. Thanks for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.